one of the first benefits to the client is they can afford to go get top-notch counsel. They're not forced to go find just someone who's so desperate for a case they'll take it. It reduces budget uncertainty. It, it moves legal fees off the balance sheet. And another big one is that it frees up capital for the client to be able to grow the business. I'm Chad Main, and this is the Technically Legal Podcast, a podcast about technology, innovation, and the legal industry. This episode focuses on a topic I've been wanting to cover for a while, litigation finance. I had a great conversation with the head of Validity Finance in Chicago office, Justin Barker, and also Bartlett Beck litigator, Stephen Noctway. Those two guys dispel some myths about legal funding. We have a great Legal Tech Founder segment in this episode, too. We talked to Brian Powers. He's the CEO and founder of PackSafe. That's a tool that lets you create, monitor, and track high-volume contracts, like quick wrap agreements. Those agreements you click on when you agree to terms and conditions on the internet. This is the first of a series of podcasts I'm doing in conjunction with the Legal Marketing Association and their annual P3 conference that they held a few weeks ago here in Chicago. The folks at LMA let me crash a few sessions and helped me talk a few of the panelists into coming on the podcast to go a little deeper into the stuff they talked about at P3. Like the two attorneys we're talking to today about litigation finance, Justin Barker and Steve Notchway. Before we get to my talk with Justin and Steve, I'd like to give a big thanks to Kelsey Goggin and Emily Schmidt from the LMA, and also give a big thanks to Keith Mazierek, who helped set the wheels in motion for these P3 podcasts. I'd also like to very, very, very highly recommend the P3 conference. I go to quite a few legal tech and legal innovation conferences, and P3 might be one of the very best I've ever been to. Top-notch panelists, extremely useful and practical information, and zero sales pitches or overt product demos at these sessions. If you want to learn more about the LMA and its P3 conference, check out legalmarketing.org. I will also put a link to all this stuff on the episode page at tlpodcast.com, including a link to buy the entire litigation finance session that Steve and Justin were panelists on. Speaking of Justin and Steve, let me give you a little backstory about them. Justin Barker is an investment manager and the head of the Validity Financial Chicago office. Before he made the move over to Validity, Justin practiced for a long time as a litigator at Kirkland and Ellis. Over at Kirkland, he was on the firm's special fees committee that oversaw cases that had structures other than hourly billing rates, like contingency fee arrangements. Steve Notchway is an attorney with the Chicago office of Bartlett and Beck, and he's involved in several cases involving litigation finance, including working on cases with Justin at Validity. So what is litigation finance in a nutshell? I'll let Justin start filling you in. Well, in a nutshell, it's any transaction where the legal claim is the security for the financing. So in other words, a litigation funder provides the funds and it is on a non-recourse basis. So if you don't succeed in your claim, if you don't win, you don't pay. The other side of that is if we don't win, I don't get a return on the money. I just lose it. So it's like any other investment. If the stock tanks, you don't get your money back. Right. That's exactly right. There are many types of, not many, but there, there are several types of litigation finance. And I think the purest one that's been around for a long time is pure contingency. Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about litigation finance and you take a step back, every case is financed by someone. It's either financed by the client, it's financed by the law firm, or it's financed by a third party funder or a combination of all of those. So financing litigation is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. What we've seen over the last few years is more third party litigation financing, but law firms, as you've mentioned, have been doing really financing for as long as contingencies have been around. Let's talk about the distinction because it has been around for a while, but I think in the last, we'll say what, seven to 10 years has definitely been a shift or more prevalence of commercial type of, of litigation finance. But prior to that, there was maybe someone fronting money for a personal injury claim, or maybe even fronting money for the law firm itself, thinking a piece of the book of the business. What's the distinction there? What's the difference between the stuff we're going to talk about today mainly versus the, you know, that more historic consumer base? Right. So there's two types. It breaks down really in two avenues. The first is consumer and the second is commercial. The consumer tends to focus, as the name suggests, on individual personal plaintiffs, personal injury, medical malpractice, toxic torts, those sorts of personal injury type cases. That's not what we're talking about today. Like validity does commercial finance, that is business to business disputes, antitrust, intellectual property, breach of contract, more of a commercial style of litigation. And I think for the most part, 
I think when people think of litigation funding, they think of, you know, the plaintiff's side, the plaintiff or the claimants funded. But that's not always the case. There is litigation funding for defendants too, right? Right. That's the area all funders are trying to figure out how to make it work. We're not seeing a lot of defense litigation funding right now. Where you are seeing it is if there's cross claims or counter claims that have a plaintiff side bend to them in a pot of money at the end that could be recovered. The other is a portfolio of cases. So the way that would work is you have a plaintiff's case or two plaintiff's cases or however, you know, you just need a, some plaintiff's cases. And then you have a number of defense cases that you could fund using the plaintiff's case. So it's really a portfolio of cases together and a funding package, but it's not just strict defense funding. So let me add there, that's what I've seen the most. When you talk about defense cases, you're really talking about for the most part, portfolio type cases where you still have some plaintiff's cases involved. It is conceivable that you could have certain defense cases where there was a a built-in bonus uh, that depended upon certain success metrics that had been agreed upon beforehand. But it's more difficult to get there. I mean, when you think about it, the reason that litigation finance works in the traditional plaintiff case so well is because if you win... There's a pot of money at the end. And so it's not that big of a deal for the client who just won a, a big uh, judgment, a big award, to then share with everyone who was uh, willing to risk share at the beginning of the case and help pay for it, whether that's the lawyers investing their fees or the litigation funder who comes in and pays a portion uh, of the cost and, and a portion of the fees. Right. And, and there's very few defense side firms right now that are putting their own fees at risk in a traditional defense side case. We do that. But as Justin mentioned, to be able to put your fees at risk and figure out at the end of the case, what does a bonus look like for a win? It, it takes a lot of work on the upfront to consider what is a win, what's not a win, and how everyone gets paid uh, if there is one. As you might expect, not every case is best suited for litigation funding. And to be considered for litigation funding, the case has to be worth some big dollars. So traditionally what you've seen is the patent cases were the you know early adopters because people had been used to monetizing intellectual property. So when third-party litigation finance started, you saw mostly patent cases and you still see a lot of patent cases. Over the last four or five years, you've seen an increase in uh, antitrust anything with a plaintiff side recovery, but antitrust, breach of contract, and in the classic international arbitration uh, arena, you see a lot more financing there. So you started with IP and now you're seeing it kind of blossom out into all areas of any sort of plaintiff side recovery. The few situations where it doesn't work is where the plaintiff's looking just for a declaratory judgment or just an injunction that doesn't have a monetary award. Uh, attached to it. But outside of those, you see a lot of financing across the board on the plaintiff side. And the cases that are being financed, I mean, they're, they're big cases. There needs to be a couple bucks involved, right? Right. So the case has to be large enough to justify the investment, right? So if you have a case that has a, a smaller award, relatively smaller, then you need to have uh, a case that's not as expensive to bring. Right. So what we're looking at generally, my general rule when I'm looking at a case is is a one to 10 ratio. Roughly for every one million dollars that I put into a case, I've got to have a case that has a reasonable settlement value of 10 million. And that's not so that I can get some amazing return. That's because when we structure a deal, we try to structure a deal so that the client gets 50 to 60 percent of the return. And in order for that to work, so that the law firm gets their share based on the risk that they put in and that we get our return based on the risk uh, that we put into the case. And we still have 50 to 60% for the client. Roughly speaking, you need a, a one to 10 ratio. There are exceptions, but that's the general rule. Interestingly, the process of securing litigation finance from a litigation financier boils down to a three-step process. It starts with a non-disclosure agreement, It moves on to some due diligence about the claim and then ends up with a term sheet signed by all parties involved. So the general process is, uh, let's go back to the example of the law firm comes to me and they say, I love this case. Will you take a look at it and potentially help finance it? The very first thing I do, 
Before I give, get into the details of the case, before I learn anything about the case, really, is I will send an NDA so that when we're having these discussion, it is the expectation that whatever the lawyer or the client share was, shares with me, that I will keep it confidential. And that, re- that goes both ways. You know, my term sheet isn't something that I want them to, to share out to the outside world either. What happens is once we have the NDA, I learn a little bit about the case and I give a gut check. I look at the, the, the standard questions I have is, are there damages here? Is the award, is there a reasonable number that can justify the funding that they're requesting? What does that budget look like? So do I have the one to 10 ratio? The next thing I do is I look and see who are the lawyers? Because at the end of the day, I'm betting on two things. I'm betting on the case, the facts of the case and the law, but I'm also betting on the lawyers. So I have to know it's, it's a law firm that, and, and a set of lawyers, a team of lawyers that I'm willing to bet on. And then I try to get to know the client. Do I believe that the client is, is a rational uh, client who's going to listen and take the advice of their able counsel? So I, we're making this assessment. And if we feel like those basic parameters are met, then I will issue a term sheet. And what that term sheet is, is the basic financial aspects of, of the case, how it's going to work. All the stuff we've been talking about. All the stuff we're talking about. You know, what is the budget going to look like? What cost budget, the fee budget? What am I going to commit to the case up front? What am I agreeing to put, put in over time as the case progresses? And what's the waterfall going to look like? I want the lawyer and the client and us, Validity, all on the same page before we take another step. So we'll talk about that. We'll make sure that we all agree once that's signed. So assume that we all agree. The client signs that. I sign that. We're off to the races. Once the term sheet is signed, I have typically a a period of 30 to 45 days to do due diligence, depending on the complexity of the case. We shoot for 30 days. And what I'm doing there is I'm doing the deep dive. So we have portfolio counsel at Validity who are experienced trial lawyers who dig deep and learn about the law and the facts of the case. Sometimes we have to hire specialty uh, lawyers. So for example, I'm not a patent lawyer. I'm not going to assess the viability of the patents. I'll hire someone to do that. So it becomes an expensive process. But this is where I really make sure that I'm willing to put money into the case. So during that 30 days, if it's shaping up the way I hope it does, and th- our analysis is this is looking good, we like this case, I will simultaneously start working on the investment agreement. So that's the legally binding agreement that lays out all of the terms. Now, our agreement is very uh, short for the industry. It's plain English. We've worked hard to make it so that it's very clear for the lawyers, clear for the, for the client what the terms are, but we're working on that simultaneously. Once we feel like we're ready to go, we have the investment agreement worked out, we've negotiated, it's ready to go. I will take that investment agreement and I'll put that in front of my my, uh, investment committee and I'll put my memo, my case analysis memo, essentially, that I've written for on behalf of the investment committee where I'm making the case why we should invest in this case. So they could say, no, it's not a done deal yet. Right. I present it to them and we essentially have a moot court. So I give them the materials in advance. They know what the agreement is. They know what all the legal issues are, the strengths, the weakness, the financials. They, they have the whole picture there. They have a period of time to review it and come up with their questions. And we get together and it's a moot court and they try to ask all the toughest questions you can imagine. So my investment committee is made up of experienced trial lawyers from former judges to trial lawyers with double my trial lawyer experience, and they have great questions. And so are you the advocate for the case then? Are you, are you trying your case there? At that point, I believe I am, uh, because I've reached the conclusion, along with the people that I've worked with, that I'm working with on my team at Validity, we've reached the conclusion that we agree with the lawyers, and we, we like the case, and we really want to do it, despite the weaknesses. We look at the strengths and weaknesses, and at that point, I'm an advocate. And, and just to be clear, by the by the time a case actually gets to investment committee, uh, take Justin, for example, they've been working on this for 
30 to 45 days. The lawyers for the client have been working on this for a long period of time. It is highly, highly unlikely the investment committee does not go where Justin is advocating because there's been so much work done to that point. Uh, I mean, it could happen, but it, it's unlikely at that point that the investment committee isn't going to see things the way Justin saw them. And that leads to another question. You said the first step, you get the NDA out there, and it has to pass a smell test. You have to be okay with the case. You have to be okay with the attorneys. But then you also have this diligence phase later in the process. What's an example of something that will kick a case out in the, in the diligence phase that maybe you didn't know about or did, didn't trigger the, 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 the smell test? Sure. So when we're digging in on the case and we find that the law uh, does not support a certain argument or we find that the defendant, there are collectability issues. Uh, I have had cases that I loved everything about the case, but it turns out that the assets are held in a foreign jurisdiction where we're probably not going to have success, right? So we'll win. Liability, slam dunk, we're going to win. And then we're going to wonder where we're going to go to get the assets. Patent cases. You can reach a conclusion after hiring a patent lawyer that there are potential issues with the patent. There are a number of ways that the case can go south as you, as you dig into it. What's the structure of a, a typical financing deal? So the general structure, like, look, there are, there, are, there are so many different structures that we have used. We try to find creative solutions to varying cases. But if I was to say the general structure that we do for a single case, it, it, is, it is like this. Again, we're trying to structure it so that we get a return to the client of 50 to 60 percent. And the way we do that is the law firm bills their time and they uh, submit the bills to us and we pay 50 percent of their bills. The law firm invests the other 50 percent of their legal fees. And so we're talking about the fees right now. Uh, we pay 50% of the law firm fees, they invest the other 50%. With respect to cost, the best way to structure this to align all interests is for the client to bear the cost so that they view the case through the same lens that the lawyer and the funder do, that it's rational, financial-minded, uh, hoping to avoid the emotional view of the case. That's not always possible. Sometimes the client just can't do it. And so uh, we will come in and pay most, if not all, of the costs in those situations. We typically try to structure it so that at some point in the case, perhaps after summary judgment, the client is on the hook for some meaningful amount of money. Not that's going to hurt their business, something that they can afford, but yet it's still skin in the game because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to align all the interests. So that's generally the structure, and the, the idea there is that we set it up from the client's perspective, it looks just like any contingency case, right? In a normal case, you come to your lawyer and say, will you do this for me for free? Will you do the cost as well, potentially? And in return, you give the lawyer 40% contingency, right? If, if you put your fees in this, 100% of your fees, you get a 40% contingency, client keeps 60. When you bring a funder in, that 40% still stays with the lawyer and is shared with the funder so that the client still gets the 60%. It's when you add the cost in there that you start getting a, a little more shifting over to the, to the uh, funder, right? I, I will boost my return slightly if I have to also pay, if I agree to also pay the cost. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute then. Let's say, you know, their discovery. That is ob obviously a lot of times big cost, document review. So... I'm assuming that if it's a case where the funder covers the costs, they're also getting that back at the end of the day. Let's say it's $100,000. They wrote the check for $100,000 throughout the case. When the proceeds are getting doled out, the financer, financier gets the $100,000, right? If the case is successful, right. then I have first priority on the money that I put out, which includes costs. And then you said, though, but you might get a bump in your return there, right? In addition to, you got your costs back, but, but right. so, you're putting so, more at risk. Yes. Yeah, so what happens is if we pay the costs, then at the end of the day, my percentage recovery is going to be uh, increased a, a little bit. And so when, when we get the award, that money comes in, um, the law firm and, and the funder are going to take their percentage. And perhaps the law firm will be at 20%, and I'm at 25 instead because I paid the cost. 
That's what we're really talking about. So it's not that I'm going to get my costs plus my percentage. It's that my total investment gave me a percentage return. And if I pay costs, it's going to be slightly larger percentage. Right. The thing to keep in mind here is each one of these, I think Justin said this, each one of these agreements is is negotiated and bespoke. He's giving you the generalizations. Each one of them also has a waterfall. It's going to say in the agreement when proceeds come in from a settlement or a, a judgment or award, how the money flows to the different parties. And the thing to keep in mind is what you really want to do from the beginning is set up a, an agreement where the client, the law firm, and the funder are all incentivized and in working for the same goal. And if you set the agreement up that way, so everyone is incentivized to kind of achieve the best result at the same time, a lot of these specifics resolve themselves in the agreement. As we've heard, there's obviously a benefit to law firms knowing that their bills will get paid because there's funding behind the case. But there are also a few non-monetary benefits that come with litigation finance that may or may not be obvious. First is that with funding, a law firm and its client knows that it can take the case down to the wire and won't have to worry about coming up with additional money to run the marathon. Also, when a litigation funder is involved, the law firm gets the benefit of a second set of eyes to look at the case and consider various angles. As is the case with Justin, many of those involved in litigation finance were former litigators themselves. There are a lot of benefits. Of course, I'm, I'm a proponent of litigation funding, so I'll probably see more than others. But I'll tell you some of the, the clear ones for me is, and, and I mentioned this before, one of the first benefits to the client is they can afford to go get top-notch counsel. They can go out and, and, and get lawyers from Bartlett back. They can go get them from other, I won't go through the litany of the great firms, um, may give me away. But that's important. They're not forced to go find just someone who's so desperate for a case, they'll take it. It reduces budget uncertainty. It moves legal fees off the balance sheet. And another uh, big one is that it frees up capital for the client to be able to grow the business. Instead of spending money on legal fees and legal costs, they can continue to grow their business while they're pursuing this litigation. And another one that we've talked about here is it really aligns the interest of everyone. We're all working for the same goal. We want to maximize the award, and we're thinking as rational actors. A couple of other things that maybe are not as quite as obvious, but when we do due diligence on a case, for the client and the law firm, what that is, is that's another free look. It's me doing an independent legal analysis. And what happens is sometimes I'll come back and say, Steve, I like this case. I think it's a great case. There were two issues that, you know, I think that maybe weren't included in your memo. Now, that's never happened with Steve, of course. <laughs> I was using him as, as an example. Of course, he, he would see every issue. But, you know, a, a lot of times we're able to uh, help reaffirm this is a great case. Let's all you know, roll up our sleeves and let's do it. There are other times where we come back and say, we really can't fund this case. Here are the problems we see with it. And sometimes that means the lawyers take another look at it and they say, yeah, it's not a great case. And maybe the case is not brought. Maybe that litigation is never filed because the determination is made ahead of time that it's not a great case. How, how often do you run into that? Because I remember in, when I was practicing you get kind of myopic. You get this case, maybe you like the client, maybe for whatever reason, you're really motivated to make the best of the case and you don't see all the faults with it. How often are you, you approached with cases where the lawyer's kind of too biased and he's not seeing some of the strengths, I mean, some of the weaknesses in the case? Well, and, and I don't know that it's always bias. I, I think sometimes you do an analysis and there's just a, a, a critical legal issue that's missed. I will say that we turn down the vast majority of cases that come to us because we have a, a high standard. You know, it's hard for me to put millions of dollars into a case that I think the probability of success is mediocre. So if the question is how often do we walk away from cases, far more often than not. It is not the case that, and I, I just want to be clear about this, generally I'm working with very high quality lawyers and they see most of the issues. We may have a difference of opinion on how something plays out, and we may ultimately decide not to fund it. I can't say that that means that the lawyers won't necessarily still try to bring the case, but it definitely gives them a, a sense of comfort and a second look to determine whether they really still want to invest in the case or whether perhaps they cut the case down. Maybe they say, 
you know, let's, let's uh, approach it a, a little bit different. I mean, there's a lot of benefits that come out from an independent second look. Let me mention just a couple other quick benefits, and they're related, and that is when you put litigation funding into the picture, another added benefit is it, it gives the lawyers staying power to see the case through to the bitter end. It's difficult. I've been there. It's difficult sometimes when you're on full contingency and you're not receiving a dime, and in fact, you're coming out of pocket for costs for a long period of time, and it becomes way more expensive than you thought, it's really difficult to stay with the case. And you start getting a lot of pressure from your partners. Well, when's this going to settle? Uh, when are you going to resolve this case? It's, it's hard to stick with it. I was fortunate to be at a place where we were able to stick with it, uh, despite those challenges. Not every lawyer has that luxury, and it becomes difficult. When you have a funder paying 50% of the fees, it's a lot easier to keep your A-team working diligently on the case. Similarly, when we come in and pay costs, and, and the client doesn't have to pay the cost, it gives them the staying power to stick with it. Or if we provide working capital so they can continue to grow their business. Why that's key is the client isn't so desperate that they take the first lowball settlement that comes in the door. That's the last thing the lawyer wants. It's the last thing that we want. It's the last thing that the client ultimately wants if they're able to think rationally. When we're paying costs or we've provided working capital, when we've taken that burden off them, they can see the case through to the very end to maximize the value of their claims. So from a law firm perspective, when is the decision made to take on financing versus a, a case where you, you don't want it, even though maybe it's available. So we view financing as a tool for our clients. If the client is unable to pay for the case and we have to figure out a way to get the case from beginning to end, and the client says we would like to use financing, we're perfectly fine with that. This is a client-driven decision, not a law firm-driven decision. So for us, it's an easy decision when the client says we want to use financing the answer is, okay, let us help you get that in place and pay for the case. If the question is, why would a, a law firm use litigation finance? The, the answer is, every law firm has a different risk profile, how much risk they're willing to take on. Everyone has to pay their lawyers, keep the lights on. And litigation finance is a tool that firms can use to offset some of that contingency risk to receive fees now. So it's really just a risk portfolio question for each law firm. How much risk are they willing to take on? And when do they need the cash to come in? We have law firms that come to us all the time. And they come to us with, with different needs. And sometimes the law firm loves the case. They have this case, they love the case, but they understand it's going to be expensive. And they don't want to be without revenue on that case for four to five years. So they come to us and say, we love this case. Will you take a look at it? And if you like it, finance part of it. So we will pay 50% of their fees and they'll invest the other. We always require that the law firm invest in the case to have skin in the game and to show they believe in it. Other times, law firms come to us with a portfolio of cases. Steve mentioned portfolios before. Sometimes they have a portfolio of cases and they want to give their clients good deals. Maybe they want to do a partial contingency on the case. Maybe they want to give a discount with a premium or some contingent bonus at the end. But what they want from us is, is to provide capital that they can use to pay costs associated with that portfolio. Or they can use that capital to hire another associate to work on certain cases. Or perhaps they need to open an office in, in Denver where one of their clients is. They can use that capital for whatever they want, including financing these cases. In those cases, we give them a, the capital and we get a capped return. So I'm not taking an interest in any specific case and, and getting the upside of that case. And you mentioned, while we're on the topic of law firms, that you pay half the law firm's rate. How often is that negotiated? So we don't negotiate the law firm rate. The rate that they're billing other clients, I will pay that. Absolutely. And, and in fact, one of the benefits of using a litigation funder is the client can go find a fantastic law firm, right? Some law firms are great lawyers, but they're not willing to 
do a case on full contingency. If you come to that law firm with a funder who's willing to pay 50% of the fees, you can hire great lawyers, right? So when a client comes to us with a, a fantastic law firm, I'm not going to quibble with them over their, their billing rates. I mean, obviously, I want the standard rate. I don't want elevated rates right. because you're using a funder. Where the negotiation comes from in, and it's not really negotiating, the healthiest model is that the law firm invests 50% of their fees. There are rare exceptions where we have agreed to fund a slightly smaller discount. But for the most part, to know that the law firm believes in the case and for them to have equal skin in the game and for it to feel like a healthy relationship, it's typically 50-50 of their standard rate. As Justin and Steve explain, for litigation finance to really work, it has to be based on a relationship of trust. The client and the funder are forming a long-term contractual relationship, right? This is not uh, the UK where a funder can control the litigation. Here, the funder does not control the litigation. They don't direct settlement. The attorney-client relationship between me and my client is still intact, even if a funder is involved, meaning all of my duties run to my client. And having a funder that understands how my, fidu- my legal responsibilities to my client and how they work is very important because we can't have funders inserting themselves into our attorney-client relationship, trying to direct litigation, trying to tell us when to settle. And the reputable funders don't do that. It's actually written in their funding agreements that they will not do that. So having someone that understands our relationship makes it a lot easier. Now I can give Justin a call and, and say, hey, this is happening in the case, and he can give me his views. Whether we take those or not is up to the lawyer, but it helps us if we're able to work collaboratively with the funder as opposed to having them almost as an adverse party telling us what to do, what not to do, and when to do it. So maintaining that kind of line of attorney-client relationship and funder relationship is important over the long term of the case. And I know, Justin, you probably have views on that as well because you have it written in your agreements and you have a certain view of it. I do. Uh, It's very important to us to make clear that we don't control the litigation. Uh, We don't control settlement. And it is very clear in our agreement. And that is why it's so important that I know I can trust the lawyer before I start down the road of financing their case. Because at the end of the day, while I'm happy to ask tough questions when we're having a strategy call, I'm I'm happy to give my views because I was a trial lawyer for many years. I have no expectation that my views will be followed. I'm not providing legal advice. I absolutely do not provide legal advice. And I do not control the litigation. And I believe it's very important for our industry that all funders get this straight. The last thing we want is funders to be trying to control settlement and trying to control the litigation because that is not the role of a funder in the United States. Right. Our clients control what happens in a case. Obviously, we offer our advice and recommendations, but ultimately the client directs what we do. And the funder can tell us till they're blue in the face they think we should do X, Y, or Z. Our duties run to our client, not to the funder. So we follow our client's advice in, in those situations. And Justin, you just said something. I want you to maybe dig a little into it. You said, the first thing I do is make sure I trust the attorney. What do you mean by that specifically? Because I think what Stephen already alluded to is the attorney's definitely – got to be able to trust the funder that they won't insert themselves in the relationship and be overbearing. But what did you mean that the funder needs to be able to trust the attorney too? So there are a lot of facets of that. I would say primarily what I'm talking about is I want to work with very capable lawyers. I want to work with lawyers who have demonstrated over the course of their career that they have good judgment, that they do, they are very diligent, that they are ethical. Those are important considerations. And so before I will start a case, I've got to believe, before I will fund a case, I've got to trust that once I start putting my money in and I'm bound to do that, 
that I can count on the lawyer making good judgments in the case and being diligent in the case. It, one way to kind of short run a lot of that, as I mentioned before, is you set up a deal where the economics are very similar for the client, the law firm, and the funder. So everyone is trying to achieve the same great result. And that goes a long way to aligning everyone's interests in, in stopping the, the sort of situation where a funder is trying to control something or direct something. You know, when everybody's shooting for the same target, they, they don't need to do that. As I closed out my session with the guys, I asked them to dispel some myths about litigation funding because there's still a few people out there that think it's the boogeyman. In the commercial finance space, I think one of the biggest myths is that the financing is leading to this large growth of non-meritorious litigation. If you think about it from just the basic economics of all of the players, that makes no sense. You have a third-party financer who's putting up a lot of capital for a long period of time. You have a law firm, as Justin mentioned, that's investing 50% of its fees. The idea that those two rational actors would invest and spend a lot of money on non-meritorious claims that they think they don't have a very good chance of winning it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're not seeing that. I mean, we would not invest our fees in a funded case if we didn't think it had a great chance of winning. So that's one of the myths, uh, at least in the commercial space, that we hear often uh, and get questions asked by clients. Isn't this just going to lead to more non-meritorious litigation? Our view is or at least my view is, no, it's going to lead to more potentially meritorious litigation of claims that had not previously been brought because the client didn't know how to pay for them. The bigger point there is there are times that you've got a smaller company versus behemoth, like patent, whatever it is, they may not be able to bring that case without funding. And that's the classic situation where you see litigation funding come in is, you know, the David versus Goliath. And I think that was probably the early stages of litigation funding. It still happens today, but those were the early cases. What we're seeing now is larger companies moving into taking funding against other large companies, in part because it makes sense for them in terms of their quarterly reporting or, or whatever their business justification for doing it. You're seeing more big business versus big business in litigation funding, which is an interesting development over the last couple of years. Do you think this B2B type of commercial litigation here, are these cases that might not have been otherwise brought because the company just didn't want to pay for it, say, seven years ago? I would say in the smaller David versus Goliath, that may be true. In the larger business to business, unlikely. The claim probably would have been brought. And really what the client is trying to figure out at that point is, how are we going to pay for the case? Are we going to pay for it? Is the law firm going to pay for it on a contingency? Or is a third party financier going to pay for it? Or is there a situation where all three of us are going to put some skin in the game, which I think is becoming more and more common? And, and let me add in there a couple of things. And the first is, I believe the case will still be brought in many cases, but the choice of lawyer will not be your first choice. You can always find some lawyer out there who will take the case. But what we're talking about is giving, for, for a meritorious case, giving the client the power to go hire the lawyer that they want to hire. The other thing that I'll add is, you know, going back to this question of, does it increase litigation? You know, the reality is, if you find a case, if you're a lawyer in a case that you're defending, and you learn that there's a litigation funder, my advice to you is to reassess your case. Because if I'm funding a case, you better believe that I think there is a strong probability of success, that I have seen something that maybe you should take into consideration. And the other thing that you should realize, and this is one of the other benefits I, perhaps I should have mentioned earlier, if you find that a case has been funded you have to know that they have the financial wherewithal to go the distance. That it, it's a meritorious case and they are there to go the distance because those are the only cases that I'm willing to finance. Have you seen it yet, or maybe it's too early, have you seen it yet where that, that maybe pushed settlement earlier in the, in the litigation than later because they figured out, hey, we got this funder behind it, they believe in it, 
they're going to go the distance, so let's just cut our losses now. It's a little early from my time as a, as a funder. I will tell you as a lawyer, I know firsthand that knowledge can have an impact on strategies of defense counsel. The sad truth is sometimes defense counsel, their strategy is drag it out, make it expensive, just make it a long, hard road where people get tired and they, and they bail out. And that's especially true when you have a David versus Goliath situation. You have a small client, the big guy can outlast them every single day until you bring litigation finance into the picture. And suddenly that strategy no longer is beneficial. In fact, it just, it's a lose-lose proposition instead of we'll wear them out. So that, that's one of the benefits that comes with, you know, look, we don't go out there and advertise when we have financed a case. We're not out there making representations and disclosing it all over the place. But if it does come out, and sometimes it does, there is that added benefit that we talked about. Thanks for being here, guys. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more, how do they find you? Justin. I'm at Validity Finance. You can find me at uh, my email address, justin.barker at validity-finance.com. Steven, if someone's looking for a good lawyer, where do they find you? I'm at Bartlett Beck. It's S-T-E-V-E-N period Nakway, N-A-C-H-T-W-E-Y at bartlettbeck.com. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Well, that's it for this edition of Technically Legal. We appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. If you like us enough, I hope you leave us a good review. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's cmain at percipient.co. And until next time, we appreciate you listening. This has been Technically Legal.